Hello, Ian Jameson here again, and it's lovely that you can join me today for a few short moments in God's Word. I'd like to ask you to turn in your Bibles again, please, to the book of Psalms, to the book of Psalms and Psalm 130 this time, Psalm 130. Last weekend, Rebecca and I had the privilege of going up to my hometown of Inverness at the invitation of the believers at Selt Street Evangelical Church, and it was lovely to be with them. It was a real joy because it was my first time uh, actually in a church since lockdown began. And there was a sense of real joy about it to be with uh, our brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus, to break bread according to the command of the Lord. And yet, of course, there was this joy, but on the other hand, this sadness, because there they were with their masked faces and there we were unable to sing the praises of God as we would wish to. So there was a real sense of sadness about it too and I, I have to confess I found it quite a moving and quite an emotional experience to be with um, my brothers and sisters in that form. You know it caused me to think again of the theme that we've touched on a couple of times already in these videos of waiting and hoping, waiting and hoping because up here in Scotland we're still in phase three of lockdown. I'm not sure what uh, situation you're in wherever you're watching from. But, you know, there's always a sense of waiting and hoping for the Christian. And in Psalm 130, what we find is a psalm of ascents, one of the psalms of the ascents or the songs of the ascents. Those songs that were penned under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that the children of Israel sang as they made their way up to Jerusalem to celebrate the feasts of the Lord, to celebrate those feasts that are given to us in Leviticus chapter 23, to make their way up to the temple to offer their sacrifices. We begin with a prayer, with a plea of the psalmist, and it's a deeply personal psalm, and yet too it's a national psalm, personal and national, designed to be sung collectively, and yet of course deeply expressive of the individual longings of believers in God. And then from verses three to four, we think about the past and God's provision for sin. And then in verses five and six, we think about the present, the present longings and that sense of waiting that there is in the Christian life. And then later on, verse seven and eight, as the psalm concludes, we think about Israel's future, uh, Israel's future, and we'll maybe think about our future briefly. <clears throat> so let's read these verses together. Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Do you ever feel like you're in the depths? Do you ever feel that you've sunk low? I'm sure that there are many believers who have felt like that during lockdown. Perhaps you've been isolated and alone. Perhaps you've just really missed the company of your brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus. And there might be days and nights where you just feel down in the depths. Isn't it lovely to know that believers have felt like that in the past, but that they have been able in the depths to cry out to the Lord and to be heard. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord, O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. For mercy. It's mercy that the psalmist desires. And why does he desire mercy? Remember what these psalms of ascents are for. There they are making their way up to the temple. The temple, the, the glories of the temple built by Solomon, I think we fail to understand just how glorious it was back then, how beautiful it was to, to make your way up to an edifice like that, having perhaps uh, had days of walking through the desert and the shrubland of Judea, and suddenly this otherworldly, this gloriously magnificent temple comes into view, and the glory of God himself begins to weigh heavy on you. The righteousness, the purity, the holiness of this God in contrast to what? To my sinfulness, to my smallness, to my wickedness. And as they make their way to offer their sacrifices, to participate in these celebrations, they must have been very conscious of their need for a merciful God. And that's brought out in verses three and four, which are a beautiful summary of the gospel. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? It's a good question, isn't it? O Lord, if you should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Of course, the answer is no one. The answer is no one. There is only one man who has ever lived if, uh, for whom if his life was to be rolled out like a 
like a carpet in front of God. There would not be a single stain or spot or blemish for God to judge. And that's, of course, our Lord Jesus. But for all of us, for all of us who are sinners, well, we can't stand before a holy God. But, verse 4, but with you, but with you there is forgiveness. But with you there is forgiveness. No other God provides forgiveness. No other way provides forgiveness. As the Jews made their way up to the mountain, they could think about the pagan and Gentile nations around them and realise and know in their minds and in their hearts They have gods that cannot offer forgiveness. As we make our way up to that magnificent temple, we realise that we have a God of holiness, the unseen creator of all things. And yet he's a God who has mercy on us. But with you there is forgiveness. That you may be feared. We start with our position. Who could stand? We move on to God's provision. There is forgiveness. And then his purpose. That you may be feared. With you, there is forgiveness that you may be feared. That could seem confusing on the face of it. If it was to say, with you, there is wrath that you may be feared. With you, there is uncompromising holiness that you may be feared. We would perhaps understand it better, but forgiveness leading to God being feared. Well, I'd like to remind you of a a verse or two in Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, and let's just read verses 3 and 4. And here Paul writes this. Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing, listen to these words, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. What a stunning statement. We could understand it if it said God's wrath is meant to lead you to repentance or God's anger is meant to lead you to repentance, but God's kindness, God's kindness is that which leads us to repentance. And here uh, there is forgiveness in God and he's feared as as a result. Then on to that present sense of longing and waiting. Verse five, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchman for the morning. More than watchman for the morning. A lot of repetition in Hebrew poetry, of course. And here, quite unusually, it's word for word repetition. Usually the same concept is repeated, but here it's the exact words just to drive home the sense of longing. Just like a a night watchman would long for the morning to come that he could go home and get some rest. More than watchman for the morning. What are we waiting for as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ? My soul waits, verse 5 says. In his word I hope, verse 5 says. What do we hope for? What do we long for? Let's leave that for just now. We'll come back to that as we close. Let's move on to the last section of this psalm and think about Israel's future. And here the, the national element of the psalm really comes to the fore. Having started... So personally, out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord, we now think of the nation. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love. That's love that does not give up, steadfast love. And with him is plenteous redemption. And he will, here's a cast iron promise, he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. This is a 100% guarantee that in a future day, Israel will be forgiven nationally for their sin. This lies ahead in God's program of redemption. And I'd like us just to leap forward a little bit to the minor prophets and to Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12, just to see a snapshot of how this will occur according to the prophet Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 12. 12 and verse 10, well known verse. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy. There we have it again, pleas for mercy. So that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child 
and weep bitterly over him as one weeps for a firstborn. There's coming a day, brothers and sisters, when the Jewish nation will realise and recognise the true messiahship of the Lord Jesus on a national scale and a sense of loss and of regret and of mourning will come upon them as never before on a stunning scale. This will be something incredible and it will happen in the future according to God's word. But there's more. Chapter 13 and verse 1. God doesn't leave them in their mourning, leave them in their bitter crying. But chapter 13 verse 1, the prophet says this, On that day there shall be a fountain opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. Brothers and sisters, we as believers in the Lord Jesus, as members of the New Testament church, we have a faithful God. We have a faithful God, a God of mercy, a God of steadfast love, a God who makes promises. He will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. And brothers and sisters, God keeps his promises. Who's the promise made to in verse 8? Made to Israel. Made to Israel. And Israel means Israel. And so God will redeem them from their iniquities. But what about us? We thought briefly of the fact that we wait as watchmen for the morning. What's our morning? What's our morning? You know, at the moment, we seem to be in this night of lockdown, if you like. And morning perhaps seems like the day when you can, I don't know, walk into a restaurant without wondering whether you have to put a mask on or being on public transport uh, without looking at rows upon rows of masked people or being able to see however many friends and family you want at once, being in church and singing the praises of God together without reservation, that seems like morning. And perhaps that day will come and perhaps it will be soon, I hope so. But there's another morning coming. There's another morning coming for every Christian. And it could be today. Today could be our last day on this earth because the Lord Jesus Christ is coming. He has promised to come and he who promised will come. And I'd like to turn us forward now to 1 Thessalonians 1, very familiar verses to many. 1 Thessalonians 1, because we have to ask the question, what are we longing for? What is our hope? What do we wait for? Or rather, whom do we wait for? The Bible tells us of all sorts of things that are coming in the future. It tells us about the national repentance of Israel and their forgiveness. It tells us about terrible things that are coming on the face of the earth. But what's the unique promise of the church? What are we waiting for? Well, Paul says this about the reception he had with the Thessalonian believers. Verse 9, For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait. To wait for what? To wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. There is wrath coming but it's been extinguished for every Christian, cancelled for every believer, and it will not be part of our life's experience. We will go to be with the Lord according to that promise he made in John chapter 14, that he's going to prepare a place for us that we might be with him where he is. What a wonderful God we have. What promises belong to us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes, we're waiting like watchmen longing for the morning and our morning is that day when the Lord himself will come and meet us in the air to take us to be with himself. Amen.